get to? Who are Gog and Magog? So far, uh, looking at the places in Revelation, we looked at Asia. This little area here, the seven churches of Asia, kind of a hard nut for uh, the early church to try to crack there, uh, went against Paul and things like that. So uh, talk to them, the Euphrates River right here, which kind of was that border of God's blessed country. Was everything this side of? Also, your Euphrates River goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. So that's how far that goes back. Egypt, of course, here. Sodom, over there. I just put it down. Uh, but Sodom, we looked at Babylon, of course, over here, and Jerusalem the last couple of weeks. Uh, all of these places are important in the book of Revelation, but as we've seen, they had also a place and a purpose uh, all the way through history, all the way through the Bible. And we can learn from that. The same goes for Gog and Magog. In fact, let's go see what happens with them in Revelation chapter 20. Let's all go there. And this is, as it says on the board, truthfully, the last battle. That's, this is it. <laughs> this is the very last one. And who do you think is going to win? God's going to win. In fact, this takes place after the millennium. So after Jesus Christ comes again, establishes his kingdom where? In Jerusalem. Uh, he will reign for a thousand years. And there's a whole bunch about that in Isaiah and in Ezekiel about what that time's going to be like and how he's going to rule. But at the end of that thousand year period, Satan, who had been bound for a thousand years, will be loosed. And let's pick up the story there in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. <clears throat> and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Who? Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. You know, notice when we were singing there, the uh, foes, uh, enemy, <laughs> the foes may be many. Right? They may be strong, but not stronger than God. And they will march upon Jerusalem. They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. What's the beloved city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. They will all come and they will surround Jerusalem. Is that any trouble for God? Everybody inside the blinking in their boots? No, because they've all read what happens. <laughs> And they compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them all. Woohoo! Woo that's it. Mm -hmm. That's the last battle. That's right. He's not going to draw it out. It's not going to be over years, world wars, and deaths. It's just like, okay, everybody, it's gone. And it's done. In fact, look at the next verse. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. It'd be those two guys, man. Those two guys have been there a thousand years longer than Satan. <laughs> That's a long time. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the Bible's pretty clear on this. You don't want to go into the lake of fire, <laughs> right? And then, of course, right after that, uh, they have the judgment and all that. So great white throne judgment and all that stuff. So we have Gog and Magog referenced here, but who are they? And we see them here in the last battle. Well, Gog, its first reference actually goes back to First Chronicles. So now First Chronicles is not one we usually go to. So but look for First Samuel, Second Samuel, First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles. All right. First Chronicles chapter 5. Verses 3 through 6. First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 3. The sons, I say, of Reuben. Who's Reuben? He is the firstborn of Israel, of Jacob. Right? He had those 12 sons. Those 12 sons became the 12 tribes. Reuben was the oldest. And his sons were Hanak and Palu, Hezron and Carmi. So not usual names we see nowadays. So, so. Now, one of his sons, one of his son's sons, somewhere along the way in the Reuben line, there was a son named Joel. 
Verse 4, the sons of Joel, Shemei, his son, Gog, his son, Shimei, his son, Micah, his son, Rhea, his son, Baal, his son. Now, that Baal one, <laughs> a bit troubling, isn't it? So it's kind of funny that in the line of Reuben, you have Gog and Baal, which are not good, okay? And I'm uh, not sure what or what that means, but that's really the first time we really see a reference to Gog. And that's what we're going to see tonight. Gog and Magog, actually, in all the, all the different places except for one, they're really hearkening back to a person, a line of people, a group of people. And most people believe that they must have been Reubenites. This reference to Gog uh, is, is Reubenites, which is kind of weird, but... That's what they believe. Now, Magog, let's go to Genesis chapter 10. And I warn you, keep a finger in Genesis chapter 10, because this is uh, the line. In fact, many call this the list of nations. Because it is uh, Basically, you can trace back most of the people to this list, <laughs> uh, of this list here in Genesis chapter 10. And in verse 2, <clears throat> It says, the sons of Japheth. So why can we trace all of them back to this list? Because these are the sons of Ham, Sham, and Japheth. And who was their father? Noah. So that means they're the only people. So that's why we can all, we're all related. You know that, right? We're all related to Noah. Not just Adam and Eve, but we're all even more closely related. We're related to all to Noah. And the sons of Japheth were Gomer. We'll get to him later. <laughs> And what? Magog. And Madai and Javan and Tubal. We'll get to him later. And Meshach. We'll get to him later. Okay. And we'll get to more later on than that. So these are the sons of uh, relations of what? Reuben and Japheth. Now, anybody know anything about Japheth? We hear a lot about Ham and Sham because Semites. Israel, or the Semites, right? They're the sons of Sham. Ham, the Arabs and the North Africa, and a lot of the people in that area are related back to Ham. <clears throat> what happened to the Japhethites? What did the Japhethites do? They took, well, they took off. <laughs> they, after, after Babel, they were like, we're out of here. And they, they, they stretched over and that's really what we're talking about here when he says Gog of Magog which we're going to see here in a minute in Ezekiel when he's saying Gog and Magog he's talking really about mostly the descendants of Japheth and the descendants of Ham who spread out who went away from this land here and went up into different places and they are the ones now that are going to come back and do what Let's go fight. In fact, this fight, that last battle, is the last battle. But there is a penultimate battle. Anybody know what penultimate means? It's one of my favorite words. I love penultimate. <laughs> Second to the last. <laughs> so, I know. It's, it's a $5 word. You only need to use a 20 cent one. But, <laughs> but there's really, and that's the thing. The penultimate battle, the second last battle, and the last battle, you know who fights both of them? Gog and Magog. So what are we talking about? Really, we're talking about the people of the world, the nations of the world. That's who Gog and Magog is. Now, again, Schofield. <laughs> he will say, and he has been the one that has emphatically taught this from left to right, all, all constantly, and been sourced that, of course, Gog and Magog is Russia. It is Russia. In fact, Magog means land of Rosh, which must mean Rosh, Russia. Meshach must mean Moscow. And Tubal must mean Tobolsk, right? That must be it. No. <laughs> no, maybe some of these people went up that far, because we're going to see, by the way, you can take a picture of this, because it's so deadly accurate. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You'll get the picture here. Uh, but, I mean, no, we're not assigning things. It's not necessarily a nation or a people. In fact, what we're going to see is it's all of them. 
All of those who spread out, all those nations who went, all those descendants of Japheth and of Ham are all going to come back and try to destroy God's people. At the end, yes, as Satan is released after a thousand years, but also before that. How do we know that? Ezekiel. Let's all go to Ezekiel. We're going to have to study Ezekiel some point. <laughs> it's, just too, it's just too awesome. <laughs> Who can tell me what the penultimate battle is according to the book of Revelation? We know the last one is the one after a thousand years. What is the battle that happens right before that battle? What's the battle that happens before the last battle? Armageddon. Armageddon. When who comes? Jesus Christ returns. That is the battle. They don't have a battle for the next thousand years. Why isn't there a battle for the next thousand years? Because Jesus is in absolute control and Satan ain't running around. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So we're not going to have no battle like that. So we have Armageddon, and then we have the other one. We know, we just read, that at the end, after the millennium, it's going to be Gog and Magog. Who fights in the battle of Armageddon? Anybody want to guess? Gog and Magog. That's what Ezekiel says, and starting in chapter 38. It's raining. Anybody's windows open? <laughs> All right. Chapter 38. And the word of the Lord came unto me, Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, set thy face against who? Gog, the land of Magog. By the way, anybody want to know what Magog actually means? It doesn't mean land of Rush or Russia. It means land of Gog. There you go. <laughs> that was helpful, wasn't it? <laughs> so, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer, and all his bands, the house of Togmara, of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Everybody's coming. And just so you get a little map here, what people are we talking about? Well, if we're talking about people of Gog, Magog, we're talking mostly this area, Cappadocia, Samaria, uh, Armenia, Iberia, Colchis, all around the Black Sea. This is Turkey, if you get a picture of it in your head. Uh, this is Turkey, Asia Minor. So this whole area, and according to archaeologists and those who have studied these kinds of things, it is the descendants of these people of the Japheth line that went up, and they started heading where? North. In fact, did they go into Russia? Yes. You know where else they went? Europe. The Celts can trace their lines back to these people. All the way into Russia, all the Gauls, all of the Germans, all of those lines can trace their back to where? This area, to these people, to Japheth, those around this side of the Black Sea. You also heard Persia. You also heard Libya, North Africa, Ethiopia. All of them are kind of surrounded, <laughs> aren't they? And he's saying all of these are going to come, but what's going to happen to them? Who's going to win? Let's find out. You ready to read a little bit? Verse 7. Be thou prepared, and prepare thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years you shall come into the land that is bought brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been all, always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So this is when Jesus, God has brought people back. There is security in Jerusalem, in Israel. All of that has come back. You all know how it works though, right? <laughs> that works for a little while. 
There's a three and a half year span when, yes, the in Jerusalem, there's sacrifices again. The temple is operating again. There is peace. People are coming back. People are coming back. What does the second three and a half years look like? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like that. <laughs> And all the people are going to look at them with envy and saying, hey, they're back again. This reminds me a lot of when Persia, remember Persia, let them come back from Babylon? And all the people started coming back to Jerusalem. What did the people all around start saying? Who let these people back here? <laughs> Who let them live uh, peacefully? Who let them come and start their vineyards and start their orchards again? Who's doing this? And they cause, cause problems, right? And this is what's going to happen. They're going to, they're going to come back, and then the whole world is going to say, that's not good. We don't want that. We don't want them living safely. We don't want them. Jump to verse 10. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass at the same time shall things come into my mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of the unwalled villages. The world's going to get this idea that they can come and they can take Israel. They can take Jerusalem, take it down. I will go with them that are at rest and dwell safely, all of them, with dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take a spoil. I'm going to come and take everything with, from them, right? That's the idea that's going to get in their head, this greed, this desire for the things of Israel as things start going well. But how's it going to end? Verse 17, jump down there. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years, that I would bring thee against them? This has been known, hasn't it? In fact, this has been the prophecy. I will bring the people back, but then there will be those who will come and attack, right? This is nothing new. We know this will happen. In fact, look at verse 18. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. This is also talked about elsewhere, book of Revelation, of a great earthquake that will split the city of Jerusalem into three parts. And there will be a great shaking before the day of the Lord. And who comes riding down after that? Jesus. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood and I will rain upon him and upon his band and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones fire and brimstone thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord which is what Ezekiel is all about <laughs> I do all of this so people will know now is this this one no it can't be this one why can't it be this one? Well, because chapter 39. <laughs> what happens after this battle, after Jesus, after God, comes down and destroys the armies of the earth? Well, after, after this battle, it's what? New heaven, new earth, great white throne judgment. We're all done. We're not done here. Chapter 39. Therefore thou son of man prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee. O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel and I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that are is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Does that sound familiar? Remember in the book of Revelation and Armageddon, what does he say to the birds? Come and what? Come and feast. <laughs> 
Come and feast upon the flesh and the birds of those in the valley. And you also get that picture of the mountains falling upon them. Isn't that also in the prophecies regarding even in Matthew? Jesus talks about that, how people will be calling the mountains to fall upon them at the face of the Lord. Verse 5, thou shalt fall upon the, upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Out there in that valley, he will wipe them all out. And I will send a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. And they shall know that I am the Lord. This is new information. Not only is he going to blow up Armageddon, but it sounds like these nations all the way through the isles, through this all. God's going to smite. But God likes to smite, right? <laughs> they deserve the smiting, don't they? Verse 7, so will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. And this is a great prophecy because, again, this is backed up in other prophecies as well, that the people of Israel will turn to their God. Especially after that earthquake that divides the city, they will turn to God and they will no longer, no longer will there be any unholiness in the city of Jerusalem. When it gets rebuilt during the millennium, they will only worship the one true God. They will be his people again. He will bring them back from all the nations into their homeland and bless them, and they will be like the Garden of Eden again. I mean, it's going to be amazing what God is going to do here. But only after he takes care of who? All of these guys. <laughs> right? In fact, look at verse 8. Behold, it is come, and it is done said the Lord. This is the day whereof I have spoken. This is the day of the Lord. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. It's not this one, is it? This, how's the Millennium Kingdom start? With a mess. <laughs> you understand that? The Millennium Kingdom starts with what? Armageddon filled up with blood and bodies and weapons destroyed and Israel split into three and destroyed and fallen down by a great... It's a mess when Jesus gets there. And what does Jesus do? Go, Wink! it's all fixed. No. It's going to take him seven years just to burn up all the weapons and get rid of all of them. Verse 10, so that they shall not take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forest, and they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoiled them and rob those that robbed them, saith the Lord God. Basically, seven years, they won't have to get any firewood from anywhere because they'll just burn weapons. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel and the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. And it shall stop the noses of the passengers. And there they shall bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. So they're going to basically have to bury all of those bodies. And they have to bury all those bodies, and it's going to be a place along a passenger, along a path. And there's a lot of theories on where this is. Uh, but it's a root. And everybody who walks by that root are going to have to hold their what? Noses. <laughs> Probably for a thousand years. <laughs> it's going to be that stinky place. You guys ever know a place like that? There was one in Bakersfield. I'm driving down the freeway, and there's one spot. And it's, uh, there was a couple of things going on there. Just like, that's this stinky place. <laughs> don't, don't like that place. Verse 12, and seven months shall be the house of Israel be burying of them, and they may cleanse the land. It's take them seven months just to bury all the bodies. That's a, that's a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown that day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. And they shall sever out men of continual employment passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it. At the end of seven months shall they search. They're going to have to go and search out the bodies. And people, as they travel along, are just going to find bodies along the side <laughs> and over here and over there. And they're going to have to then go and bury them properly. And it's going to take seven months. 
searching out and finding bodies to bury them. Verse 15, the passengers that pass through the land, when they seeth a man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Amon Gog. How specific is this? <laughs> this is what's going to go on. You're traveling along in Israel, like, oh, there's another dead body. Here, put a marker. Or drop a pin, <laughs> you know, on your phone. Drop a pin, dead body here. And then there's going to be people with constant employment, 100% employment in Israel. Why? Either rebuilding <laughs> Jerusalem or burying bodies, basically. Right? <laughs> it's a living. <laughs> they got to do what they got to do. Let's jump to verse 17. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl, unto every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come. Gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bullocks, and them fatlings of Bashan. And you shall eat fat till you be full, and drink blood till you be drunken, and my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. So, and again, this is in line with what Revelation says. Come and, and eat. So this is the battle. The penultimate battle is the battle of Armageddon, and it is against who? Gog and Magog. And God, and this has been the plan. But who are they? Well, we have a lot of names. Meshach, Tubal are mentioned over and over again. Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, and Tagmara are all mentioned in this list. Who are they? Well, let's go take a look. And where do you look? You look at the list of nations. Let's go to uh, Genesis 10. Who's Meshach? No, it's not Shadrach, Meshach. It's Meshach. <laughs> it's not Moscow. Meshach was a person. Anyone want to guess whose son he was? Son of Japheth. Uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 2. We read it before. The sons of Japheth are who? Gomer. He's listed in Ezekiel as part of this band of people. Gog and Magog, along with... <clears throat> Gog, who was a prince of Meshach and Tubal, along with Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, and Tomorah, they are all the ones that are going to come and try to destroy Jerusalem and Armageddon, right? They're also the ones that are going to try to destroy God's people at the end of the millennium, all right? That's who they are. It's Gomer and Magog, we already saw that, and Madai and Javan, and who? Tubal, also, and Meshach, and Tyrus. Verse 3, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Ripatha, Ripath, and Togmara. So Togmara is actually the son of Gomer. And by the way, there is another Gomer in the Bible. Anybody know who it is? It's a woman. Yeah, she's a woman. Hey, 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 Hosea's prostitute wife. So, so not related here. <laughs> right? So these, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, and Tagmara are all related to Japheth. So these are the people. And where did they go? Meshach can see his descendants go up to Iberia and Colchis. Uh, they're the ones that seem to, according to archaeologists and anthropologists, feel like they're the ones that drew the drew the four, most north. Into, anybody know what's just north of the Black Sea here? It's kind of a big battle going on here. Ukraine, Ukraine here, Russia here. <laughs> so and the battle's over what? The Black Sea. So this is, this is going right, right up into Russia. And also all those people are probably related to Japheth. And they're the ones that are going to come and where? Attack here. So Meshach, mostly Iberia. So they drove up north. Tubal is Cappadocia. So this, again, this is Turkey. Uh, so they're in this area along that side of the Black Sea, the northern part. Uh, Gomer is Samaria. They're called Samarians. And it's kind of the dead center of Turkey there. And uh, Tagmara is more Armenia, 
which is this area over here. So really we're talking about this swath of people over here from the north. And they're always talked about as people from the north who will come and attack Jerusalem. So that's what we know from Genesis 10, verse 2 and 3. Let's look at a couple other things about Meshach, though. Let's go to Psalm 120. Psalm 120 also mentions Meshach. Meshach. I'll read it again. In my distress, I cried in the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. That sounds good, doesn't it? What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of, a, of the mighty, uh, with coals of juniper. Woe is me that I sojourn in, what, Meshach? That I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. So already in Psalm, these are known as a people of what? War. <laughs> And to be with them are to be people of lying tongues and be people who love war and not peace. So that's not a good thing. Also, what else we know about them? Ezekiel 27. Ezekiel 27. Other, the more, other translations do spell it Meshach. It there, there goes both ways, yeah. yeah. So. Because it is shh yeah. sound. It's, sound. <laughs> so. it's easier for us to pronounce it if we read the yes. H. <laughs> Ezekiel 27, verse 13. Javan Tubal, which is here, right? We're going to hear about them as well. <laughs> so, yes. Javan Tubal and Meshach. They were thy merchants. They traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in thy market. And this is in Ezekiel uh, talking about Tyre. Tyre, which is located right around here. Uh, it was one of the richest uh, of all the countries and all the cities. Uh, it was destroyed by Babylon according to God's prophecy, exactly as God said it would be destroyed. And here in Ezekiel, he's saying they will be destroyed, destroyed, destroyed by Babylon, and the people that will cry about it are who? Meshach and Tubal, <laughs> because they were great, not only the people of war, but they're also people of what? Trade, which is interesting, because at the end of, the, end of times, when Babylon falls, who's crying? Tyre is crying, <laughs> and all of those people who trade with it. That's what Revelation says. So Babylon, when it falls, Tyre is crying, and all the people like Meshach and Tubal who trade with them will be crying, which will probably lead to them trying to do what? Destroy Jerusalem. <laughs> Things are going well for them. Let's take care of them, right? So uh, this, this is the kind of place where Meshach and Tubal are, okay? Now Tubal, again, son of um, Japheth, uh, he, they come, this is Cappadocia area, so this north under the Black Sea, and it's no, no coincidence that they like around seas, because Japheth people somehow living a, a year on a boat uh, after a flood said, let's do that more. <laughs> they were noted for that. So we know a little bit about them. Let's go to Isaiah 66:19. And this is the end of Isaiah, and Isaiah at this point is declaring a, actually a blessing uh, of the kingdom of God uh, for Israel. Look what it says. And I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations to Tarshish, Pool, and Lut, that draw the bow to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off, that they have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, that they may declare my glory among the Gentiles. And basically in Isaiah he's saying when the kingdom comes, the kingdom of God, which we know happens when who shows up? Jesus. Right? Jesus said the kingdom of God has come. And when that comes, the glory of God will go out to these Gentile places like where? 
Tubal. And it will go up here like to Cappadocia. And the word will go out to him. So the word will go out, but evidently, <laughs> end of the day, they're, not, they're going to be tacking, right? So just a mention there of them there, okay? Then we also, in Ezekiel, have mention of Persia. Do we really need to talk much about Persia? Where is Persia? Persia is Iran. So it's this area. If you look at a map, this would be Iraq along this Euphrates River. And, of course, Iran would be huge. Iran is quite large. Uh, out this way, and that was the Persian king, the Medo-Persian kingdom. And we know from Daniel, it was the one that was prophesied to destroy the Babylonian Empire, and they did. Uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah prophesied that they would be the ones to let the people come back out of captivity to Jerusalem to rebuild, uh, which we see in Ezra and Nehemiah. Esther, everybody remember the story of Esther? Where was she at? Kingdom of Persia, right? But they are also part of the band of Gog and Magog, <laughs> and they will be the ones attacking, and we'll be attacking here against them, right? And then, of course, we have Ethiopia, also known as what? Cush. Who's Cush? Well, let's go to the list of nations. Let's go to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 8. And the sons of Ham. Who's the first son of Ham? Cush, which is Ethiopia. They came down here and they drove into Africa. So Cush, um, Seba, Havilah, and Sapta, and Rama, and Sabdeca. And the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan, and Cush begat Nimrod. Oh, that great hunter. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. If you remember from our study of Babylon, he's the one that went from here up to here. <laughs> so in the valley here and amongst the Assyrian areas of later time. So, And in verse 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So... We have here Cush, which drove into Africa. It's also interesting, we won't go there, but Genesis chapter 2, verse 13, uh, says that the rivers that ran through Eden ran through Ethiopia, particularly the river Gihon, which I find interesting because does anybody remember what spring is in Jerusalem? Gihon. <laughs> spring. A little small place, but that's where it kind of came out there. That was their water, main water source for that fortress on that little mount in Jerusalem uh, was Gihon, and the Gihon River is the one that we're seeing, and it goes down and runs through Ethiopia. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> so also we see them in Ezekiel 30. They are ones also trading with who? With Tyre. <laughs> also they're the ones making alliances with Egypt, when Egypt falls. And that's the interesting thing to me. Who don't we see listed? Look up on this board. Who don't we see listed in the Gog Magog um, panoply of people? Egypt. Yeah. Egypt. And Babylon? Yeah. And Tyre. <laughs> and Revelation says what? They're already toast. <laughs> they already took out the desert. Oh, those guys are gone. <laughs> so it's the rest of the world uh, that will come and will try to destroy Jerusalem. So uh, Libya, uh, also known as Put. I might say it because it's fun. <laughs> uh, again, uh, son of Ham. So they're descendants of Ham, and they did the northern Africa area. And again, much trade with Tyre. So they did a lot. They through the Red Sea, they through Libya, did a lot of trade with Tyre. Uh, Gomer, uh, also a son of Japheth, uh, went up here to Cap uh, Samaria, and Tagmara went to Armenia. So what we see here, so when they say Gog and Magog, who are they talking about? They've made it clear. Who are they talking about? According to the list of nations, these are the descendants of Japheth, who drove north, all these Gentile areas up here, and also the sons of Ham in Africa along this route here. They are the ones who will come and will attack who? Jerusalem. Where? In Armageddon. 
and Armageddon we will look at next week. Where is it? <laughs> What's its significance in the Bible? But we're going to see that. But they're the ones that are going to come and do that penultimate battle in Armageddon, and they will lose. Jesus Christ will establish his throne in Jerusalem. He will rebuild. If you look at Ezekiel, he will rebuild the temple to direct specifications that goes on for chapter after chapter after chapter in Ezekiel. <laughs> He's going to restore sacrifices. He's going to restore the wall. He's going to restore the city of Jerusalem. He's going to restore the entire area all the way out to Euphrates of the, the, of the nation of Israel and its promised land. And it will be like a garden of Eden with water and vineyards and everything flowing. And for a thousand years he will reign here and it will be a paradise. And the end of the thousand years, guess who shows up again? Gog and Magog. <laughs> they say, ah, we can do it this time. So Satan has put it on their heart that they can destroy them this time. And how long is the battle this time? Fire came down and destroyed them all. And then we have the great white throne judgment. So who is it really? It's really, it's really the Gentiles. <laughs> That's who Gog and Magog is. It's the nations uh, that went out from this area and now are trying to come back and destroy them. That's all we know. Uh, any other guesses about specific nations? Well, it's this nation, it's that nation, this is that prince, this is that ruler, this is, you might as well try to figure out who the beast is. No idea. Will we know when it happens? What's his point then? His point is these nations twice, the nations of the world will drive against Jerusalem. These descendants of Japheth, these descendants of Ham will try to come and destroy God's people and they will lose how many times? Both times. Okay. One time it will stink. <laughs> Second time he'll do a better job cleaning up. <laughs> All right. Any questions or thoughts? Interesting. Yeah. So I, I encourage you go go if you want to read more, just read through uh, Ezekiel 90, 38 and 39. It's, it's pretty interesting. A lot of detail on there that we really didn't go over. But uh, in fact, Ezekiel I'm finding is just like this is life in the millennium. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it's going to be like, people, when God brings all of his people home. So we'll see how it goes. Okay? Any questions? All right, let's pray.